Okay, and thank you everyone for being with us. And I apologize for the technical difficulties we had last week. We had trouble getting the YouTube stream to come up, and then in the middle of everything, the audio just went out. So I think I've gotten gotten those issues taken care of today, and we we are on both the bridge and on the stream. So I wanted to continue on a little bit um, with some more ideas, c kind of tied into what we talked about last week. And if you remember last week, what we were talking about is we were talking about the importance of doing what we can, doing what we know how to do, and doing the thing that is <clears throat> that is actually the most effective thing that we can do to be the change that we wish to see in this world. And this, of course, came about through the, the recent events in world history, the recent events in our own country, uh, the, the horrific shootings, the violence that we're seeing, the the explosions, uh, <clears throat> all, all of the, the things that just come to us in the news and it leaves everybody just wondering, oh my, oh dear, what can I do? What can I possibly do? And as human beings, there's probably little that we can do. And, and maybe that's what frightens people so much, they feel helpless. But as spiritual beings, there's everything that we can do and there's everything that we ought to do. The importance of a regular spiritual practice is, is what essentially we were talking about last week and we're talking about this week. Right? There's, something, there's something that will make a change in us. There's something that will make a change in our consciousness. There's something that will make a change in all consciousness. There's something that will bring about change in the world. But we must be about that business. You know, we, we must get on with it. You remember in New Testament theology, <clears throat> we're told uh, that when Jesus was 12, his parents lost track of him at the uh, the festival for Passover. They had returned to Jerusalem. Remember, Judaism at that time was a religion uh, of the temple, and everybody in that uh, everybody in that religion had to go to the temple a couple times a year for certain festivals. And it was you can imagine a big crowd. Imagine if everybody everybody in the entire country had to go to that temple at the same time. It was crowded, and uh, and he got separated. He got lost, and his parents finally found him. And he was at the temple, and he <clears throat> he was teaching as a twelve-year-old boy. He was teaching, and they said they were worried. You know, what parent wouldn't be worried? We're worried about you. And he says, "Well, didn't you know I needed to be about my father's business?" And of course, there's, there's many reasons that that story is there. Whether it's literally true or not, there's many reasons why it is there as, as a teaching story. But being about our Father's business, being about what we can do, not as human beings, but as spiritual beings, that's what we're talking about today. So, as I mentioned last week, and I'll just mention it briefly again, it, it's, it comes to our attention, all these things come to our attention, and it's upsetting, and, and people, people are upset. And they want to know what they can do. And the first thing that we have to remember is, is that we're just, we're just being made aware of these things because they're happening so close to home. But these kind of things have been going on for a very long time and they continue to go on. And if we lived in another part of the world, uh, we would experience these things on a daily basis. You know, if you see pictures of war-torn countries, look at, uh, look at Lebanon, for example, where beautiful downtown sections, uh, you know, that used to be uh, tourist areas, tourist resorts on the Mediterranean are <clears throat> just bombed out shells of everything now. Think of what people in, in Iraq go through every day with everything that goes on there. Syria, Afghanistan, Yemen, all these different places in the world that are hot spots. And yet we, we hear very little about them on a regular basis. We hear, we hear now and then we hear something in the news. If you follow uh, Twitter feeds, you'll you'll hear more of them frequently. But my point is, is that human consciousness is as it is, and it's been doing these things for a long time. And it is only when it comes to our attention that we we kind of get disturbed by it. And perhaps that's a, a sign that we are not. We are not really in touch with what's going on, that we're really not paying attention. We're, we're happy to be diverted. We're, we're happy to, to see some kind of entertainment show or sports show or something else that takes our minds away from the tragedy of the world. And that's human and that's understandable, but that doesn't produce change. That doesn't make, 
make things any better. And the real question that people have, have seemed to be asking is, well, what can we do? What can we do to make things better? And if we, if we really want to do that, I think we must be aware at all times of the need, of the opportunity of making things better at all times, not just when we hear a story in the news because it happened uh, in our country, but because at all times human consciousness has the opportunity to change and to develop and to grow. Now, in some teachings, <clears throat> they teach compassion as kind of, kind of the, the motivating force for spiritual growth. And they have their students or their adherents start their day with a meditation on compassion. They have them to imagine all of the pain and all of the suffering that is going on in the world this day and to try to, to make it vivid and, and to try to, to come to see it and to experience it. And then, they, and then to take all of that pain and that suffering and to project it onto someone they love. To, to imagine, for example, that their mother is the one who's enduring all of this suffering. And, to, and the purpose of that is to arouse within, within the, the adherent, to arouse within them this great, this great compassion. And then they ask the, the students or the adherents to take that pain and suffering from their mother and to imagine that they're taking it on to themselves. Now, I don't advocate doing that, right? because what you think about is what you get. What you believe is what you get. So we don't want to focus on pain and suffering. We don't want to focus on trying to take pain and suffering and, and bringing it on to ourselves for the, for the benefit of all humankind. But we do want to understand what it is that we can do as spiritual beings to alleviate the pain and suffering of all humankind. We want to be compassionate, but we don't, we don't want to be caught up. We don't be, want to be sympathetic in that we are caught up and we actually experience the pain and suffering because at that point, we can't help. We can't help. And it's like being on the airplane. The, the, the mask comes down. You have to put the mask on yourself before you can turn and help the one next to you. So what we want to do is, is we, want, we want to find a way to be compassionate. We want to find a way to be effective, and we want to find a way to be helpful. But we don't want to be caught up in the problem and, and therefore be a part of that problem. That is the challenge that we are facing. Can we be in the world but not of the world? Can, can we be in the midst of all of the drama but not caught up in all of the drama? And it's, it's important. Sometimes when we talk about things like this, uh, people who, who are not quite in tune with us say, well, isn't it selfish? Isn't it selfish that, that you don't want to be caught up in this? Don't you, know, don't you think that you ought to be? And the answer is no. No, it's not selfish. It's probably the best thing that anyone can do because as we're told, if the blind try to lead the blind, they both fall in the ditch. Somebody has to be clear. Somebody has to escape the, the drama. Somebody has to get out of it in order to, to be able to help others get out of it. These are the kind of things that we were talking about last week. So last week what we said was that we know that the root of the problem is in consciousness and that working in the world of effect, working out there in the physical world, while it is good, while it can temporarily alleviate pain and suffering, so, you know, surely if people were starving, giving them food is, is something that you would do. You know. But you, we also recognize that if, if all we do is give people food, we haven't changed anything, that, that the reason that there's starvation, the reason that there's they're hungry in this world is largely an issue of human consciousness. As Louise Hayes said, it's not that there isn't enough food in the world, it's that there's not enough love in the world. If there was enough love in the world, we would get the food that we have to those who need it. I don't know if you remember, maybe, uh, maybe 25 years ago now, um, when, when the United States sent the Marines into Somalia to try to alleviate the suffering there, um, we were bringing in shiploads of food and trying to get the food to the hungry people, and and the warlords in the area were stealing the food. They were t they were taking the food. So the food was there. There was enough and plenty to go around, or at least there was enough to go around. 
and yet human consciousness was trying to hoard it, trying to take it, trying to manipulate it and use it for their own purpose. You know, in some cases they were t taking labels where it said uh, uh, a gift from the people of the United States and they were, they were painting over those labels and putting their own names on it. So we have to understand that the problems are in consciousness, the problems are in human consciousness. And certainly trying to feed people is a good thing to do, but it's not enough. And it's never going to be enough. And if that's all we do is feed people, then we've actually done very little. We've done very little. And human consciousness is fickle. It moves quickly from one thing to another to another. Like I said last week, I know I've said it before, if we look at Haiti, for example, you know, when the earthquake struck there, there was, there was a great public outcry and a lot of media attention and, and people flying planes in to, to deliver medical supplies, and then it kind of went away. It went away from consciousness. It didn't go away from the experience of the people there. For years later, I was watching the news, and they were talking about a hurricane approaching Haiti, and they were talking about how many hundreds of thousands of people were still living in tents. <clears throat> here, here it had been years. It had been years since, since the earthquake, and hundreds of thousands of people were still living in tents. So this consciousness of, of doing, this consciousness of busyness that we live in, is a fleeting consciousness. It moves from one thing to another, to another, to another. And it typically doesn't really make, make much lasting change, much lasting difference. But it's built into, it's a bias that's built into our consciousness. In the cavalry, they had a saying that said, when in doubt, gallop. You know, <clears throat> in the infantry, <laughs> we had a saying that said, don't just stand there, do something. And I remember as a private, learning everything that I needed to know to survive in the army as a private. And it was, it was very simple rules. It says, if it moves, salute it. If it doesn't move, pick it up. If you can't pick it up, paint it. That was it. These were rules of behavior. These were things that you needed to do. So today, what we are, we are talking about is turning away, turning away. And where this comes from is it actually comes from the term repent. Uh, I'm, I'm reading uh, Emma Curtis Hopkins' book on high mysticism, and the first chapter, she talks about the first step. You know, she, she has 12 practices, she calls them, 12 practices for the development of the soul, 12 practices for, for <clears throat> moving toward the mystical state. And the first one is repentance. Now, I know many of us, we talk about repentance, at least for me, it brings up kind of images of, of uh, the old black and white movies of the 50s where they... They had the uh, the tent preachers, you know, and they would they were having revivals and big signs, you know, repent, repent, or or perhaps in modern day times, you know, you had the cartoons. Uh, maybe it was Larson. Somebody always had somebody carrying a sign around that says, "Repent, the world is about to end," you know. So this kind of this kind of idea that that repentance was caught up in in old old time religion, and maybe somehow it doesn't it doesn't apply today. But we have to go back and ask ourselves, <clears throat> of course, as we do with any term like prayer or faith or anything, well, what is meant by repentance? What is that? And, of course, it has many different meanings to, to many different people. And interestingly enough, one of them is to turn away. It, it might mean to turn away. It might mean to turn back. Or it might mean to return, to return. So if we have a notion, if we're stuck in a notion that repentance is somehow being riddled with guilt and, and remorse and sorrow and, and trying to change our evil ways and, and, and all those things those, that come to us kind of through, through perhaps movies and, and television and all that, I invite you to take a step back and say, what, what we're talking about what Emma Curtis Hopkins is talking about is a change, a change, a turning away, a turning away from what, and a return to what. What is it that we're talking about? But it is a most important step. So many religions teach the importance of repentance, even if there is an agreement on what repentance is. I thought, and I, that kind of struck me as, as amusing or entertaining or, or curious, maybe is the best word, curious. 
we don't know what it is, but we all agree it's important. It's important, you know. It's uh, it's kind of like the uh, the movie Vacation, where the the cop pulls over Chevy Chase and he says, "Do you know what the penalty for that is?" Chevy Chase says, "No." And he says, "Well, I bet it's I bet it's pretty serious, you know. We we don't know what it is, but it's it's got to be serious. It's got to be important." So this idea then of of what we must do if we really want to, we really want to take this step, and this is important. Do we really want to take this step? We want to make the break from human experience. We want to make the break from thinking of ourselves as in purely human terms, and we want to start to move into the experience of our spirituality, the experience of our spiritual nature. And I think I think that if we if we live long enough, if we think about it long enough, if we study it long enough, I think we we, we must sanely come to the conclusion <clears throat> that Einstein you know gave us. He said to continue to to do the same thing over and over again. And expect different results is insanity. It is insanity. And if we look at the world the way the world is today, I think the best description is it's insane. It's insane. It's insane because it is trying to do the same things over and over and over again that it has tried to do for all of recorded history and for for thousands of years before recorded history. Trying to do the same thing over and over and over again, and it is expecting different results. And it is it is never going to get them. Right? It is never going to get them because what it's giving out, it is giving back. And at some point, we have to ask ourselves: Do I want to be part of that? Do I want to be caught up in in that <clears throat> the wheel of life? Do I want to be caught up in that drama? Do I want to be caught up in that dream? You know, Groundhog Day, the movie with Bill Murray, where everything just keeps happening over and over and over again? Or do I want to break out of that? Do I want to step out of that? Do I want to turn away from that? Do I want to repent? So what is it we're turning away from? And then what is it we're turning towards? Now, Emma Curtis Hopkins... (coughs) very plainly in the introduction to this work talks about the three levels of experience the material, the mental, and the mystical and now I've been talking about the three levels of consciousness for years and it took me years to discover it and of course here it is on the first page of her book which which only tells me that I wasn't ready to understand that when I picked up her book a long time ago and didn't understand it <clears throat> But we want to keep in mind there's, there's, there's the three major approaches. And there are things that, that can and ought to be done at each level. But it is, it is the mystical level. It is the level that I'm talking about, which is the experience of the presence of God, the mystical level. That that is the level that we have to uh, at least be aware of and aspire towards. That's where we're going. Okay, That is what we're returning to. It is the direct experience of the presence of God. Now, there's a time in life when we want to work in the material world. We want to do things in the material world, and there's a lot of focus on activity and doing. And you know, In business, we used to say, what have you done for me lately? How many, how many dollars worth of sales have you closed this month? How many contracts have you signed this month? All, all of those kind of things in the world of doing. And there are, there are people in human consciousness that no matter what the problem is, is no matter what the situation is, is, is they are prone to action. They will jump in and they will start doing stuff. And they'll feel very, very good about it. They're doing things. But in the long run, they're not making much difference. They're just busy. It's, they're just keeping busy. We used to call that drilling holes in water. You know, lots of, lots of splashing, lots of noise, lots of things going on. <clears throat> Then we come to the, to the realization that simply working in the world of effect and doing things in the world of effect, why, 
that doesn't produce change, right? Jesus said, the poor you'll always have with you. The poor you will always have with you. Why would that be so? Well, because consciousness hasn't changed, see? And until consciousness changes, the poor we will have with us. So then we come to the, the, the second level. It said, well, let's work on this from the, the mental level. Let's work on this from the consciousness level. And, and here this is kind of uh, what, you, what you would call in, in, uh, in change management. This is the training initiative, you know. This is deciding, well, we need, to, we need to send everybody to training because if we just give them different information, they will, they will just naturally have the big aha experience and, and behave differently. And, of course, they don't. We so you spend a lot of money training them and they go right back to, to doing things the old way because there hasn't been that, that shift in consciousness. So that's what we talked about last week is how do we create that shift in consciousness and we do that through our spiritual practice. We do that through effective prayer, through affirmative prayer. Right, Emmett, Fox, Emmett Fox says the thing that changes consciousness is prayer. Now remember Emmett was working very much in, in level two in the mental level, calling, calling it mental science even. See? Very, very biased in that, in that world view. And it's, it's a good worldview, and it's a worldview that we have to go through. Uh, remember, uh, Emma reminds us in her writing, she says that if you study the ministry of Jesus when Jesus was here on earth, he worked at all three levels. When people were hungry, he fed them and gave them loaves and fishes. Now, he didn't produce them through the normal physical means of working by the sweat of his brow, but he took care of their physical needs. He fed them. When people were confused in their thought, he would correct their thought. He would say, well, you know, you've heard it said this way, but I tell you this. Okay? You heard this, now I tell you this. He was, he was lifting their thought up uh, to another level. But then he would take it to the mystical level. I and the Father are one. You and I are one. Everything you need is provided. Ask and you shall receive. This is kind of going more to the, the mystical level, the experience of the presence and the activity of God. So there comes a time when we work at the physical level, but we recognize that working at the physical level is not enough. And there comes a time when we work at the mental level and we do, we do our affirmative prayer we do our spiritual mind treatment, and we do it on a regular basis, right? a regular basis, and we start to experience a growth of our soul. We start to experience a change in the circumstances of the world. But then there comes, there comes the next step. So Emmett Fox says that the thing that changes our consciousness is prayer. And Joel Goldsmith, who is a mystic, takes it to the next level. And he says, what changes our consciousness is the experience and the activity of the presence of God. The experience and the activity of the presence of God. And that is really, really what we are seeking. That is really what we wish to have. That is really what we are returning to. Now, with, with regard to this importance of our spiritual practice, I don't think I can, I can emphasize this enough, right? That there, there has to be a routine practice of some sort that we engage in if we truly wish to grow, not only for our own benefit, but for the benefit of all humanity. As the Dalai Lama puts it in one of the quotes that's attributed to him is, is that today I earnestly work towards enlightenment for the benefit of all humanity. Today I earnestly work towards enlightenment for the benefit of all humanity. That somehow, that somehow by my moving out of the dream, moving out of the, the illusion, moving out of the maya, <clears throat> by my breaking free of this insanity that that is going to that is going to help all of humankind <clears throat> now I also thought it was interesting if uh, 
if you look at, at some of the teachings of the Dalai Lama, he he had a way has a way of making things very simple, you know. And he at one point said, somebody asked him what it was that motivated people, and he said happiness. He said everybody wants to be happy. You know. I mean, can can we get that? Can we recognize that? that no matter where people are, no matter what their circumstances are, that fundamentally what they want is to be happy. So we're all seeking happiness. So you could say at, at level one, at the material level, he says, well, just simply do this. Just simply do this. Stop doing the things that make you unhappy and do more of the things that make you happy. Now that, <clears throat> it seems simple enough. But we, we suddenly find out that there's, there's a, an awakening in that. Because we suddenly find out that as human beings, we confuse pleasure with happiness. We want to do the things that give us pleasure. And then we find out that pursuing the things that give us pleasure well, that makes us unhappy. What if we don't get it? What if we don't? What if we don't get the car? What if we don't get the house? What if we don't get the boat, or, or whatever it is that we think is going to make us happy? What if? What if this person I think I can't live without doesn't want to marry me? You know, we suddenly find out that all of our ideas of what makes us happy is going out there and getting something and bringing it in. We may get addicted to that which we think gives us pleasure. And then we have to worry about what happens if we don't get enough of it. You know, What happens if we can't get any more of the substance or the circumstances or the, or the people who we have become dependent upon? See? So now we're in level two and now we're starting to realize, whoa, this idea of just do do what makes you happy and don't do the things that make you unhappy. There's more to it. We have to, we have to think about that. We have to, we have to really, really think about that. And what we come to realize if we follow that very simple and very simple idea is, is we come to the idea then that in order to be truly happy, we have to break out of the cycle. We have to break out of the attachment to both the physical and the mental. And we have to move into that third mystical level. The simple level of consciousness, pure consciousness being aware of itself. Of the I am knowing that it is and knowing that it is as us. So we start to realize then that everything that is being done in the physical world, everything, is turning to dust. It is all turning to dust. I love the picture uh, that, <clears throat> that NASA had, and it was published on the Internet. And it was a picture of Earth, and I think it was taken from a spacecraft that was out at Saturn, and it was shot through Saturn's rings. You know, and there's this tiny little, tiny little dot, this tiny little blue dot in this vast, vast blackness. And that's us, see, that's Earth. And you start to get the, the realization then that what is it that we can do? What, what could we possibly do? As, as great an accomplishment as I think I can accomplish on this Earth, what can I possibly do that's going to make a difference out there? to the rest of the universe. And we see how, how silly that notion is. That, that doing alone is enough. Because everything that we do, everything that we build, everything that we're working towards is turning to dust. Someday the sun will explode and that little blue planet will be gone and everything on it. So, <clears throat> putting all of our time and attention to that which is going away, to that which doesn't last, is not productive. And we, and we kind of 
start to realize that that the thoughts, the ideas, right, the 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 intellectual activity that is taking place in human consciousness here on this earth, while it is good, while it produces things, while it can help us to do things to to alleviate pain and suffering, to make life a little bit better, that it too is changing and it too is going away. And we also have to realize that it too is incomplete. It is incomplete. You know, our, <clears throat> our Western minds and our science is very proud of itself. It, it, it is, and it should be. It has, it has done, done seemingly miraculous things, you know. Taking iron, which sinks and makes making ships out of it that float. Taking concrete. I remember when I was a kid and I found out they made ships out of concrete. I thought, how can that be? <laughs> you know. We built bulkheads out of concrete and they stayed down in the water. Somebody's making ships out of them. It's amazing. But if you look at at our Western philosophy, if you look at our Western intellect and our way of thinking, our logic and reason comes to us primarily from the Greeks. Now, there are, there are other systems of thought older than the Greeks, other systems of thought, and probably better systems of thought. But we focused in and we, we kind of took what the Greeks are teaching us. And in that, in that way of thinking, it's very binary. Something is true or it is false. You know, something is, it, is, it either is or it isn't. That, that's all there is to it. There's just kind of these two states. And, we come up with these little truth tables that simply have, you know, four boxes on them, and it is or it isn't, and that's that's just the way it. That's the only ways of thinking about it, you know. And yet, if you go to Indian logic, which predates the Greeks, something might be true, something might be false, something might be both true and false, or something might be neither true nor false. And we, in, in our way of thinking, says, well, that's double talk. That can't possibly be. It's either true or it's false. It can't be both true and false. It can't be neither true nor false. You know, it is true or it is false. And it's kind of like the argument between Newtonian physics and quantum physics, you know. The electron is there or it's not there. Well, no. The electron may be there or it may not be there or it could be there and not be there all at the same time. And it blows our mind, you know. <clears throat> I don't know if you you follow this, the science reports on the internet, but the famous quandary of, of quantum physics is is called Schrodinger Schrodinger's cat, and the, you know it's about a theoretical cat that's in a box that may be both dead and alive until somebody opens the box to look at it, and we don't kind of understand that. And then last month they came out with a report that said, ah, but it's the cat's in more than one box at the same time. And this comes from the, the experiments regarding uh, light. Is light a wave or is light a particle? And if you want to confuse yourself for the rest of the week, go on the Internet and, and look up the, uh, the double slit experiment with light, and it'll kind of explain it. And what they're talking about is, is that sometimes wave, uh, light acts as a wave, other times it acts as a particle. Sometimes it starts as a particle and it becomes a wave, vice versa. Maybe it's both at the same time. My point is this. My point is is that, that we have put such pride and such arrogance into our ability to think intellectually, and now suddenly we have to realize that the intellect can't know it all. The intellect is not capable of knowing it all. Scientists will say, <clears throat> the, best, the best scientific minds will say, well, there's, there's this thing called the Big Bang. And at the moment before the Big Bang, the universe was a singularity, which philosophers and theologians talk about God being the singularity, the great unity, being one. And if you say, well, what, what was it like at the moment of the Big Bang? And the answer is, we, we don't know, because all of our ways of thinking, all of our ways of measuring, they, they, they don't work. They don't work in, in that environment. So the mind points to the fact that there was something there, and the mind has to acknowledge that it's not capable of knowing what was there, and it's not capable of knowing what preceded it. And this is what Emma Curtis Hopkins, I believe, is talking about when she says, 
we have to let go of the idea that somehow somehow our actions that what we can do is going to to enable or create or cause us to have the experience of the divine nothing that we can do positively or negatively that that is going to make that so it, we can kind of create an environment of you know stillness and quietness and those things but there's really nothing that we can do because it is not a physical exercise. The experience of God is not a physical exercise. There's nothing that we can think. You know, there's no, there's no logic or reason that is going to take us to the experience of God. It can point us in the direction, like science can point us to the Big Bang and say it's there. And but I can't tell you what it is once we get there. So our intellect can tell us that there is this thing called the experience of God. But it can't take us to it. It's the razor's edge. We walk the razor's edge. We use the intellect to take us to a point where we know that the intellect can't go. And we have to do that without falling off. And what it comes to then is we must develop practice. We must develop practice for no other purpose than communing with the divine, experiencing the presence of the divine. Now, I think I told you this one time. <clears throat> I met a, a man who was a musician, and he was from India. And uh, he, we were talking about uh, religion in America, and he didn't have a very high opinion of uh, religion in America. And he said that when he was a boy, he took music lessons, and he would go on a regular basis, and he would go to his music teacher, and the music teacher would demonstrate something for him, would explain something to him, and then would give him homework to do, you know, practice. Now, I want you to go home and practice your scales. Anyone, any one of us who ever learn how to play an instrument, you know, you have to go home and you have to practice. And what he said was, if he went back to his teacher, when he went back for his next lesson, the teacher would say, okay, show me the result of your practice. Show me that you have mastered what I gave you to do the last time that you were here. And he said, if he hadn't done his homework, if he hadn't done his practice, if he had not mastered the technique that, <clears throat> that his teacher gave him at the last lesson, he says the teacher would stop right there. The teacher would stop the lesson. He says, I can't teach you anything else. He says, you haven't learned what I've given you to learn yet. Go home and practice. And when you've mastered what I gave you so far, schedule an appointment and come back. <clears throat> but I'm not wasting my time with you sitting here showing you again what I showed you last time because you have to put in the effort. You have to put in the work. If you want to be a musician, you have to do it. I can't do it for you. And what his point is where he was going is is that his view of American religion is is that people go to church at 11 o'clock on Sunday morning and they listen to flowery words and, and their heads bounce up and down and they hold hands and they, and they sing hymns and they feel really, really good for that hour. But on Monday morning, they're exactly the same people that they were on Friday afternoon. And they go back to just the way that they were. They don't practice what they preach as, as they go through their week. There's no growth. In other words, you go to church every week, and it's the same, same, the same, without a moving forward. And what he was trying to say in the conversation is that Truth, in his opinion, and I would agree with it, in his opinion, you know, if we wish to grow spiritually, we have to have practice. We have to engage in our practice. If you, if you want to develop a fit body, you have to, you have to engage in physical activity and exercise. If you want to, if you want to be fit mentally, you know, you, you keep your mind active. You know, they've got these puzzles now that you can do that, that supposedly keep you alert. 
I think curiosity is probably enough for most of us. But if we want to be fit spiritually, we have to engage in our spiritual practice. So the first part of our spiritual practice, one that we talked about last week, uh, is using our affirmative prayer. Now, certainly, you know, studying and listening to lectures and reading books and all our education is an important part. But we must put into practice what we have learned. And we know how to do our spiritual mind treatment. We know how to take time and to go in and to set into motion that which will cause a change in consciousness that will alleviate the conditions that we want to alleviate in the world. And the next step, the one that we, we have to get to, the next step is we have to realize that as good as that is, and we're not going to stop doing that, but as good as that is, there is something that takes us a step further, which is what Emma Curtis Hopkins is talking about, <clears throat> what Joel Goolsmith is telling us about, which is bringing ourselves into the realization that our best knowledge, our best intellectual knowledge is not good enough, that our best effort physically is not enough and that what is required is moving beyond those things to that which we can't even explain, the ineffable. In India they call it, they, they have a saying, oh ineffable one, oh unknowable one, that which is beyond thoughts. And in, in the Upanishads there's a, a quote in scripture that says, you can't know me, you can't know me with your two eyes. So I have given you a divine eye, a divine eye. And what we want to do, what we want to do in our practice is to be able to bring ourselves beyond our thoughts. We want to, to go to that point that the teachers would say is where the mind falls away. We want to go to the point where the body falls away. We want to go to the point where the mind falls away. And we want to move into the experience of simply being. And it is that experience of the beingness, that experience of, of the divine, that prayer takes us to. But it is also an experience that perhaps meditation is a little bit better at taking us to. What we want to understand is that this is not about getting something that we don't already have. We cannot reach out there. This is why the Dalai Lama statement is so brilliant. Right? Do more of what makes you happy and less of what makes you unhappy. We can't reach out there and grab anything to bring to us to make us happy because that's not what happiness is. We can't reach out there and bring anything to us to facilitate the experience that is beyond words, the experience that is beyond thoughts, the experience that is beyond doing. because that is not the kind of experience that it is. So we must repent. We must turn away from the idea of the physical. We must turn away from the idea of the mental. They are good as far as they go, but they don't go far enough. And we must return to the mystical. So the process then is not a process of getting more, more spiritual, and bringing more spiritual stuff into our lives. It is a process of letting go of the physical. It is a process of letting go of the mental. And in very, very simple terms, this is what really gets me. Th these words come to us from thousands of years ago. You know. Now who would want to go to a doctor 4,000 years ago if you were sick? What kind of knowledge did you think they would have? But yet these words come from thousands of years ago and they are as true now as they were then. And who taught 
these people these words. Be still and know. Be still and know. The Tao tells us that the one who practices perfect non-doing, doing non-doing, that's the one that does all. Who taught these people thousands of years ago? And the only thing that I can think of is, is that they were in touch with the ineffable. As Ernest Holmes tells us that at some point in our spiritual development, our only desire is to be at home with the beloved. And I believe that what Miss Hopkins is talking about today is turning away turning away from the drama of the physical world, turning away from the insanity of the mental world and just simply being at home with the beloved. So the practice, the very simple practice then is a practice of stillness. It is taking, making the time and having the discipline and taking a place where you can simply be. You can simply be. It is turning off the phone and the computer and everything else that goes on. It is finding a comfortable position. It is becoming aware of that which already is. Breathe in. Breathe out. Breathing is occurring. Breathe in, count one. Breathe out. Breathe in, count two. Breathe out. Go from one to five without losing count. And if you do lose count, that's fine. Go back to one. If you make it all the way to five, go back to one. And just see how many times you can do that without losing count. If you lose count, go back to one. If you can get a little timer or set a timer on your watch or your cell phone or tablet. See if you can do it for ten minutes without losing count. If you can't, don't worry about it. Go back to it. Go back to one. Start all over again. What this simple technique does is is it teaches us that we don't have to be caught up in the drama. Thoughts don't necessarily stop. Thoughts are still there, but they're off in the distance in the background. Like like a radio playing down the hall. You can kind of hear them, but you're not really caught up in them. As we learn to detach, as we learn to detach from the physical activity, as we learn to detach from the mental activity, what is left? What is left is the essence of who and what we are. What is left is the experience of the stillness. What is left is the experience of the oneness. And we can just rest in that. Just rest in that, even if for a moment. Goldsmith tells us that he encouraged his students to meditate five times a day. And he also encouraged them many more times than that during the day to take what he called a simple God break, to just stop for a moment. Just take a moment to remember what that experience of stillness is like. Take a moment to be in the presence of the divine. And he also asked his students to make one of those five meditations. Now, they might have a meditation where they they focus on love, or they might have a meditation where they focus on peace. These are good. These are good things to do. But he asked them to take one meditation a day. By meditation, he he was referring to, to stillness, not what we would call a guided meditation, where there's a constant, somebody's voice constantly telling us what to do, but simply be still and know. And he asked them to take one meditation a day, for no purpose at all. Just to be with God. And when they finish that meditation, to say to themselves, 
that through this meditation a greater desire to know God has entered this world. Your spiritual practice, my spiritual practice, our spiritual practice is the most important thing that we can do. We have to make time. We have to take time. We have to understand that what we are doing is real and it is tangible in a spiritual world. We have to understand that the world is suffering because of the consciousness of the world and what is going to change the suffering is the change in consciousness. We do our works at the physical level. We, we, we give our money to the charities. We go and do our volunteer work. We do all the things that we can do physically, but we recognize that that's not all that's required. That's not enough. We do our work at the mental level through education, through, through speaking, through writing, through trying to, to awaken or arouse within others a desire to be helpful. And we understand that that too is not good enough. We do our <clears throat> affirmative prayer. We begin to work at the spiritual level to use and cooperate with the powers of the law of mind the power that responds to prayer so that through our deliberate activity changes in consciousness occur and we also take the next step which is to simply return to that place in consciousness where there are no wars that place in consciousness where there is no poverty there is no starvation, there is no injustice, that all of those things are an illusion, all of those things are a dream. We return to that perfect place in consciousness referred to as the garden. And we realize that by our giving our effort, our personal effort, to awaken, our personal effort to work towards enlightenment, our personal effort to realize the Christ consciousness within ourselves that we can't help but realize it within all of humanity and we can't help but be the change that we wish to see in the world. So I invite you this week to consider to consider how much time and attention that you have and how much time and attention that you've been giving to your practice and to try to find a way to increase it, whatever it is. If it's no practice at all, that's okay. That's, that's where you're starting from. Give yourself a few minutes a day. Try to build up as the weeks go by. If you're doing 20 minutes a day, can you do 25 minutes a day? Can you take little God breaks during the day, in between phone calls, in between opening letters, in between talking to a client, can you just stop for a moment and acknowledge the presence of God? When the drama comes before you on the news or in the break room or at the water cooler, can you take a little God break and take a deep breath and say, none of this is real? All that is real is the presence and the activity of God, and this too shall pass, and it is already in the process of changing. So I refuse to get caught up in it, but I return my gaze. I turn away from the appearances, and I return my gaze to the presence and the activity of God. And in so doing, it makes its appearance in my life and in all lives. You are the blessing that the world is seeking don't, don't try to work in the world at the rules that the world has created. Do your work at the spiritual level where it is sure to make a difference. And so it is.